Well, hey there, everybody. It's Mr. V. Today, we're going to level up your painting skills by talking about a new process in your workflow that I started teaching my students here, and it's called ambient occlusion. So with that, let's take a look at it. and Let's get started. So ambient occlusion, if you've played video games and messed with some of the video settings to improve the performance by either reducing the quality or enhancing the quality, you've probably come across this term called ambient occlusion. It's a little checkbox where if you click on it, your shadows all of a sudden look a lot more realistic, but your frame rate takes a hit. So in art, especially digital art, ambient occlusion is a thing that we do as uh, mainly looking at shading and lighting. All right. So when you're working traditionally, you're typically thinking about directional lighting. All right. That would be, hey, where's the light source? Where's the cast shadow? Where's the midtone? And how does that impact the form? And, and then we suggest that the form turns by changing the values. So value change equals form change. All right. The most natural way to work. Well, ambient occlusion is a little bit different than that. So ambient occlusion, if we switch over really quick, to this image uh, looks slightly different. It feels a little bit more relief, meaning it's almost as if it's raising up out of the paper and the shadows are there, but they're doing a very different thing than the shadows over here. Why is that? And what does that even mean? So in general, ambient occlusion, that is what we call a contact shadow. That would be a contact shadow that is independent of the directional light source. It is non-directional shading. So this image is the image of the inside of a room that has an LED light installed in the ceiling and the wall. It wraps around. It's pretty cool. I'd like some of that in my house. But even so, with that light source smack dab against the ceiling and the wall, notice we still have an area here of shadow. You'd be like, well, how could that be? Light's right there, okay? That's because the light rays, wherever they come from, get trapped in these little creases. And the formula or general rule of thumb that I tell my students is whenever two planes or surfaces meet, the light rays get trapped. They're not able to escape and get to your eye. So that's the least, um, the least intense right up next to the light. And it gets more and more pronounced the farther away that you get. Oftentimes in art, we use this to define creases and folds and small edges. Uh, it makes the image pop. And so if we look over here at this piece, uh, what is being ambient occluded? <laughs> that would be things that are on top of other things. For example, the mustache raises above the chin and the lips. That would not necessarily cast a shadow, but it would have an area where light would get trapped, which might be a construed, construed as the same thing. All right, the area where the tunic comes into contact with and is in front of the sleeve, you know, that's going to be an area that has some AO. Um, creases, folds, even large gaps of negative space, that would count indeed as well. So breaking it down, what kind of brush do we typically use and what do you see? Well, with ambient occlusion, you oftentimes see a hard edge to a soft edge transition. You've got an abrupt start of the shadow and then a general fade out. And we call that fall off. Fall off is when the effect of a thing becomes weaker and weaker the further away from the source that it originates from. Imagine a candle in a darkly lit room. As you get further away from the candle, the light strength of that candle would continually get weaker and weaker and weaker. And the shadows would be very hard edged right up next to the candle, but begin to get softer and softer the further away they get. So when you're doing your AO, you generally want to have a hard edge to a soft edge. It creates that relief effect. It's painted on its own layer set to multiply. And then what you do is uh, this does not replace directional light, but it's added to it. So as you would have other layers that would be for the core shadow, other layers for the lighting, and you have an AO layer underneath. So here's an example from one of my paintings where I extracted some of the AO uh, from the rest of the painting. And then here's a portion of the layer uh, in production as well. So again, you see very clearly defined hard edges um, on areas that are hard edged, on areas that are rounded, which are most of the forms here. You've got a soft edged fade to it. Uh, it's because most living things are round. And when you have a rounded form, the values fade gently out. And so I used a soft edge brush combined with a lasso tool. So you lasso and in your layer, 
you paint generally uh, with multiply blending mode, or you know you can play with other blending modes and then even maybe change the colors of your shadows. Uh, I, I just chose to do black for this, and um, and then you can work it into the piece from there. So let's take a look at the method. Now let's physically do it, uh, and I think I'll do it with a mouse, the clunkiest of supplies, just to show you how the mask masking control does all the work. So here is some AO in process. And let's look at a couple areas where we're going to have contact. That would be likely at the base of these little triangular pointies. So we're going to get some contact that goes up into this spiky bit and then some that fades off. Well, that's fine. Well, let's take this little guy. So right about here, you're going to get an area where it's going to connect with the form. And then what I do is after protecting that edge, I then loop way out. So that gives me enough room to add a lot of, uh, you know, so my brush has room to work. So I'm going to use just the color black. I'm set to multiply. And I'm just going to turn down the strength of my brush down to like, you know, 20 or 30 percent. And it's a little powerful, actually. Let's go, let's go like to 20. And I'm just going to brush in a little area. And then I'm going to invert because some of that contact shadow is going to go up the form as well. And we're left with this really janky shadow. And sometimes, if you want to, you can use a soft-edged eraser and feather out any mistakes that you had with your lasso tool. So let's get rid of that. And now we've got a nice little contact shadow there. Let's try another one right over here. Let's have the area where it comes into contact with the skin. And then invert. To invert your selection, it's just Control-Shift-I. And then everything on the other side of the lasso tool will get selected. Notice I'm painting way outside of the selection, so just the edge of the brush gets uh, gets grabbed here. Let's do this one. So let's do the outside of the little cylinder form. And then using just the edge of the brush, let's add some value in there. Contact point. And then let's invert and get a little bit of value going up. All right. So now we have some shadow coming into contact. Let's look at the bicep. So I'm going to mask out the edge of the torso over here and some of the clothing where it's important. And then who cares about this area out here? If you need to get rid of a selection, just hold down Alt or Option and then draw around the edge. We want the bicep masked with the clothing here, not just the empty space. And then let's grab uh, a big brush, get your very big forms in first and then you can work progressively with your tighter edges as you work from there. All right, so you can get some crease uh, inside of the shadow shape that you worked with. If you spill into an area, don't worry, just go and erase it out. Uh, and then you continue adding some of these values within these hard edged forms. So the area here with the wrapping in the fabric. Each little wrap is progressively more and more on top of the other. And I got quite a bit of that shadow on top of this gauntlet here. So I'm going to erase that because it is in front. We're going to have kind of a crease in this area. So look how far outside of the selection my brush is just to get the faint edge of that brush. I'm not actually painting all tons inside of there. And again, if you have a hard edge, just feather it out. And by working in this manner, it does actually take quite a bit of time, but it's worth it. Let's get this wrapping right over here. And so I'm going to mask out this little edge. Add a little bit of value there. And you have a thing on top of another thing. You just keep working in that manner. And if we uh, periodically turn off our line art and take a look, it starts to read as if it's starting to raise up. And you do that in your very broad shapes first, and your progressively narrower and tighter shapes last. Let's go take a look at a piece that's partially in production and see where AO sits with the workflow. Um, there are many different ways to paint. In this one, I did a really janky color flats. Put the AO on top, directional lighting, core shadow, 
and then continually built up from there with different lightings and then digital effects. So the AO itself, it sits, I had that at the bottom and then I chose to put the directional light on top of that, then the core. You could do uh, AO on top of all of it if you want, um, with exception, I think, to the highlights. The highlights I found in a workflow are very helpful for cleaning up your, your tangents, your edge control, because where you have a bright area, that typically overshines any other stuff that you had underneath it. So I would recommend just putting your highlights on top to refine your edges uh, as you paint. But uh, you can see if you have your AO as its own layer, that tightens up your shadow edges and value shapes anyway. So, so it, it really is up to you and what you find useful. Uh, it's I find it to be a very helpful tool to really clearly define my planes and then add a one, two, three, uh, to add the bounce light on top of it. Uh, or you could just do the whole thing traditionally in one layer. Um, you don't have to use this method at all. As a matter of fact, I do have a layer here where it is just um, traditionally painted, right? So um, where you have directional lighting and then dark areas where forms come into contact with each other. Uh, you can do that all in one layer. So, so it's really up to you and your workflow. Uh, sometimes separating things out helps. Sometimes it makes it more complex. But either way, uh, there are many ways to achieve strong lighting and form definition in your paintings. And this I found to be useful in its own situations and you know sometimes uh, for most things that I do. So I hope you found this helpful, everybody. And I look forward to seeing you guys in class. So take care and have fun painting.